As many of you may already know, next year marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of Charles Darwin and the 150th anniversary of his landmark work, The Origin of Species. And yet after all that time, the concept of evolution by natural selection continues to be rejected by a sizable proportion of the world's population, even in some of the more technologically advanced societies. Today's speaker, Mary McCutcheon, Mary McCutcheon, Ph.D., will explain the reasons for this remarkable resistance against scientific understanding. The title of her talk today is Understanding Creationism. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary McCutcheon. All right, I've got this down here. From It sounds okay to me, but I'm not the audience. It's okay for you? Yeah. Um, I never thought of myself as, as getting involved in creationism until, um, until I began to think about an episode that happened around 1972 when I was a teaching assistant at the University of Arizona. I taught basic intro <laughs> to anthropology that included a segment on kinship. So one of the assignments that I gave was the students had to do a two or three generation family tree and then circle their patrilateral parallel cousins and their matrilateral affinal uncles and so forth and turn it in and I got the expected bundle of eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper from everybody but one girl. She came to me after class and said can I bring my assignment to you to your office? It's too big for me to carry uh, with me today and I said well, okay, a little bit apprehensive because my office was about the size of this room, but I shared it with about 25 other teaching assistants. And we all had desks that mercifully we had joined the four corners together to allow enough room for the passage of people. So the total surface area I had was four times my desk size, so it was a reasonable size. And in she walked with something that looked like a roll of wallpaper. So I asked my, my fellow desk neighbors, please clear your, your stuff off your desk. We're going to unroll this thing. And out it rolled. And I just looked spellbound by this job she had done in the tiniest handwriting. It went from the left side all the way to the right side. There she was on the right side with her brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts. And there on the extreme left side were Adam and Eve. <laughs> so I caught my breath and the only thing I could think of to say was where's your patrilateral parallel cousin and who are your matrilateral affinal humbles and aunts and uh, so she, she didn't want to mark up her thing but she pointed to them and I said well, okay. <laughs> she rolled the thing up and out the door she went. And the rest of the teaching assistants who were in the room at the time were just stunned. Somebody looked out the door and saw that she was long down the hall and the whole place broke out in this huge guffaws of laughter. And I thought, well, that poor student. She did what the, she thought was an A-plus job and she basically just barely succeeded in doing it at all. Um, and then I started going to these debates. You know, you'd see them public, publicized here and there. Debates between the, the creationists and the evolutionists. And I was struck by how pathetically the evolutionists did in these debates. And so let's look at some of the, the history of the debates just for a minute. The first and most famous of all the debates was um, William, no, so, sorry, Samuel Wilberforce, the son of William Wilberforce, the great abolitionist. Uh, so Samuel Wilberforce, nicknamed Soapy, took on um, took on T. H. Huxley, and the famous conversation that I think was never written down at the time because I've seen it paraphrased and it was slightly different wording, but more or less this is how it went. Wilberforce stood up and pointed to Huxley and said, was it through your grandfather or your grandmother that you claim our descent from a monkey or your descent from a monkey? Huxley replied, I am not ashamed to have a monkey for my ancestor, but I would be ashamed to be connected with a man who used great gifts to obscure the truth. And so that was probably the first and last time that 
the evolutionist got the last word on the subject. From then on, it's been downhill. And one of the key people who died, he is no longer with us, but he would leave evolutionists completely flattened. And his style was, I, I never heard a debate, but, but the National Center for Science Education has uh, the, the uh, I think even some videos of some of these famous debates. He was legendary for being able to put anyone down using the most bizarre logic, and of course handpicking his audience, that didn't hurt. So I had to wonder how come evolutionists get creamed in these settings when everything seems to be in their favor. For instance, look at this fossil. What is that? How could anyone deny the, the persuasiveness of this thing? And look at the molecular genetic evidence the comparing human chromosomes with chimpanzee chromosomes. Hands down convincing comparative anatomy. And we have our cute pictures of our relatives. And of course, you pick them with babies because of the neotenous qualities that show very human-like. Oh, of course, in the middle, that's not a baby gorilla. That's Coco's kitten, in case you didn't know. Uh, and then we have on our side uh, lots of good jokes that ridicule these people for their uh, completely um, absurd <laughs> ideas. How could we keep losing? Well, what I would like to say today, this is kind of the outline of my talk today, we don't understand creationism very well, and we need to. Number two, we need to understand why creationists keep sucking in the public to an extraordinary extent where, if you believe these polls, something like 40% of the American people are young earth creationists. And uh, I just learned of some research from Penn State that shows that one out of six high school biology teachers are young earth creationists. Okay, how do we account for that? There must be some arguments out there that are com incredibly compelling um, and appealing to people. We also might as well listen to their arguments because sometimes I personally have found things that make me take a double take and recognize that some of the points they're making are valid and that we'd better, we'd better attend to some of our arguments if we want to capture an audience and get them to think as the skeptics would like, to, to think critically and to assess evidence in a, in a rational way. So we've got to be better at dealing with, with evolution. We've got to be prepared and prepare students also to deal with the allure of creationist arguments.